a consulting company. Uh, and so before I joined the firm, essentially uh, my undergrad masters were in maths and then my PhD was working with uh, this type of models known as a Bayesian network. And so um, before we dive in today, so I'll just put up the agenda, would really love to sort of like get some feedback from people. So like using the reaction buttons uh, that we have in Zoom. So if you go to the, to the reactions, um, if you guys have ever done any sort of machine learning, modeling, data science stuff, could you press like the green tick button? Um, and if you haven't, then maybe the red one, and then we can just get a sense as to uh, how many people have and haven't done ML before machine learning and data science. Okay, so most people have, but there's a couple of people who haven't. So uh, not to worry, we'll, we'll do a bit of an intro first before we, before we dive too deep. And then um, second question guys is, um, who has come across Bayesian networks before? Who has actually used a Bayesian network? So again, like a green or red cross. Yeah, there we are. Expecting a lot of red, a lot of red crosses coming up. There we are. Okie dokes. Cool. All right, that's kind of what I expected, uh, but just wanted to check before uh, before I dived in too deep. So as I say, first first bit will be a, uh, a bit of an introduction, uh, going through ML, trying to motivate why would we ever want to use these things that no one has ever heard about uh, Bayesian networks. And then uh, we'll dive in a little bit deeper uh, into the steps of learning them and using them. So kind of uh, for the guys that have used uh, machine learning models before, so things like sklearn, uh, you guys will probably have used like linear regressions, decision trees, random forests, neural nets, these sorts of things. I'll try and explain and go like, how does this compare uh, to what's going on in uh, other sort of data sciences that you've, that you've uh, seen before? Right, straight into the intro. Um, so something hopefully that everyone's going to be familiar with, because I think this is something that is kind of like drilled into us at school. Um, so kind of like pre-uni school, right? Um, and this is probably comes in everybody's maths that you've seen, is this concept of y equals f of x, right? So you, you guys have probably seen this, uh, if, in, if at least in nothing else, you've probably seen it uh, in uh, with a linear regression. So we have y, which is normally referred to as our dependent variable. And then we have our x, which is normally referred to as our independent variables. Um, this is taught commonly in these schools, right? But kind of it also really, uh, it translates into machine learning as well. So it translates into real world data science, um, where, you know, instead of kind of like doing basic linear regressions, essentially uh, the f, the function, uh, the models that we're using can get quite a bit more complicated. And there is lots of different types of machine learning and the f doesn't ne you know, necessarily need to be always complicated. Um, when we care about getting a really, really accurate model, and we really care about the performance because we want to use the uh, we want to use the model to make predictions, then we would use a really complicated F, right? Because we really care about getting the best Y possible. And these types of machine learning is normally referred to as predictive machine learning. There are other types of machine learning though, where sometimes we don't need it to be super complicated. Uh, we actually want it to be more interpretable uh, because we want an explanation as to what's going on. And so you can kind of think of that linear regressions are very interpretable models, right? So you have a, I mean, it's easy to plot in 2D, it gets, you can plot it in 3D and it gets harder after that, but uh, essentially uh, you can understand the coefficients uh, that are coming out uh, of, your, of your linear regression, you know, how much, how much X um, multiplied through by the feature uh, to get my Y essentially, right? So this is uh, an example of an interpretable or descriptive case as why we would use machine learning. And then one that you may not have come across so much at school, but actually maybe if you guys are using, uh, if you're doing CompSci uh, at NUS, then uh, you guys may be tackling optimization problems. Um, I know I did uh, when I was doing my, my master's uh, as well, and we, we in, in CompSci stuff, we were doing optimization problems. Um, essentially, this is where we care about, and this is sometimes known as prescriptive algorithms as well. Um, this is where we really care about choosing the best possible X, basically. Okay. So whilst we still you know, use the equation y equals f of x, um, we have a different focus in, uh, you know, we can use it for different purposes, right? And this is just one single way of, of choosing and like dissecting and splitting up uh, different machine learning models. There's other things like unsupervised versus supervised. So wh whether we actually have a target to aim at or not. There's things like linear versus nonlinear. There's things like regression, uh, where we have a continuous target variable, so a continuous dependent variable versus a class. So like we either have a number to predict or we have uh, a class type to predict. And the reality is that 
it's really, really complicated as to what model you should use and when. In fact, different data scientists, different people building models on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and different reasons if you have projects at uni and if you are going to be, uh, I, was, I was talking to the guys who are organizing this uh, before everyone else uh, entered the Zoom call, and they were saying that kind of like more of the machine learning modules uh, for like later years, for like uh, in years two and years three. Um, so when you guys have to choose what models to use, it may not be a simple decision, right? And um, the, the class of models that I'll be talking about today, actually, in, in my opinion, at least, I think if you ask a different data scientist to map out, out models, they would probably give you a slightly different answer. Uh, in my opinion, these sit right in the middle. So they're very, very, very uh, applicable because they're both quite explanatory, uh, but they're also relatively performant as well. So they can be used for both predictive uh, and descriptive explanatory modeling. But the choice of model is not the only thing that we have to think about when we are uh, kind of like building a machine learning model. There's lots of other things which, you know, actually come from the problem we're trying to solve. Um, so I've already touched on the fact that, you know, certain problems require explainability. Um, so certain models say, say like a neural network, you would never use a neural network um, if you wanted to, if you wanted the end person looking at the model to understand why it was making the decision, right? It's, it's far too complicated. But there are certain techniques that you can apply on top of a neural network. So you may have heard of things like Lime and Chap. Um, actually, Chap would be quite, uh, actually, you could do Chap. Uh, there are certain explanation techniques that you can apply that would help you explain what's going on inside the model. So um, there may be ways around it. Um, the type and the, the reason that I'm here today, I guess, and one other element that may be important is the causality. I'm sure you guys have heard the very famous uh, moniker that uh, correlation is not causation, right? Very, very, very famous phase. Uh, the problem is that uh, quite a lot of data scientists, and when we're using machine learning, quite a lot of people ignore this, right? Because actually machine learning normally is only able to handle correlation. It can't handle causation, right? If we use observational data, data that was collected you know, before and it's, it's all confounded, et cetera, I'll get into those words a little bit later. Uh, then it's actually not true to, it's not actually possible to find the true causal link between things. Like it's just not possible from data. But we still want to do it, right? Because if we want to, if we want to build a model um, and someone was, and it was an interpretable model and someone was to try and understand it and look at it. And if the model, the, the outputs that it was giving, um, if it didn't make causal sense, uh, they might not trust it, right? They, they would say this model is wrong. Uh, it doesn't make sense. So I have, a, I have a question for you guys to start with. Um, can anyone please tell me what is going on in these graphs here? So like, please feel free to just like use the chat box or unmute yourself and just say uh, either way, um, what's going on here? So on the left chart, we have um, a question, should we get rid of firefighters? So we have the number of firefighters going up. We have the severity of damage from a fire going up. On the right-hand side, we have uh, the number of, um, uh, number of sales of hot drinks and the amount of skin damage that you get from sunburn. What is going on here, guys? Is there a causal relationship? And in order to, you know, reduce the severity of damage, should we get rid of firefighters? And should we sell more hot drinks to cure sunburn? What's going on? You never know. Okay. Correlation. It is. Okay. So purely correlations. Common R. Ah. Excellent. Okay, I like this answer. So common cause, right? Indeed, there's something else, right? It's not the fact that, uh, so it is definitely true, uh, these things are correlated. Uh, there is a hidden variable. There's something that's known actually as a confounder, right? So something that is actually driving both of these things, right? So something that drives the severity of damage and the number of firefighters is in fact like the intensity of the fire, right? You don't send lots of firefighters to a tiny fire and a tiny fire doesn't cause like lots of damage. So what we're basically seeing here is correlation essentially getting confused for causation potentially. So I, I saw this on LinkedIn a few weeks ago and I, I had to put it in the presentation. I thought it was hilarious. You guys are probably gonna think I'm sad, but you've got these two guys here pushing the van. You've got this guy here also pushing the van. Uh, these two guys are having a little bit more impact than this guy though, right? So kind of, um, I, uh, I thought that um, sort of summed up in some ways, correlation versus causation. Okay, let me give you a, a second example. 
Um, and then we will uh, get a little bit deeper into Bayesian networks. So second example, uh, imagine that we control the data, right? Imagine that we have this data generating process, right? So this just follows a system of equations. So R and A are just kind of like independent normal distributions. Then C is made up of R and A, T is made up of R plus some noise, Y is, equal to, uh, y is made up of T plus 10A plus some noise, right? And this is the system of equations is also just mapped out as a graph, okay? So for you guys who all ticked green when you said that you'd, uh, you'd been doing some machine learning before, you'd, had, you'd seen some models. Could you guys please tell me? Uh, so second question, we've got two models here, right? Just very simple linear regressions. Uh, we, we're looking at Y as our target variable, and we're, looking, we're interested in the effect of T. Uh, which would you guys say is the better model, right? So this first model here, uh, we only have uh, one variable, T, which is explaining our Y. And in the second model, we have uh, T, and we also have C, car, which is explaining the Y. So if you were to look at some of these metrics, I'm sure you guys, some of you guys will have done this before. Anyone want to take a stab at which would be the better model? What would you say? Let me give a bit of a hint. These are the areas to look at. Okay. Oh, well, okay. These might be the areas to look at. Okay. So R squared. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, guys, because I, I know that we don't have a lot of time together. And um, so let me, um, let me just sort of like take you through it a little bit. So normally, um, if we're looking at models, we look at the metrics, right? So kind of like in RMSE, RMS so root mean squared error, a bigger RMSE is worse normally. Uh, and, a, and a higher R squared is better, okay? So R squared is your explained variance, essentially. So this model here basically explains none of my variance, right? It goes between zero and one as a metric, and I'm pretty close to zero. Whereas this one is at least 0.4. Not, not fantastic, but not horrible, right? And my RMSE, which we want to be as small as possible, has come down. But, so these are the coefficients, right? So this is just a linear regression. So this is like this number multiplied by the variable is supposed to explain the y, right? So y is equal to this multiplied by this. So whilst this by the metrics is a much better model, if you look at the t, so here t is very close to one and here t is very close to minus one, right? If we look at the true relationship between y and t, you can see that actually t multiplied by positive one is actually the correct answer, right? T multiplied through by negative one is completely wrong. It's completely against the data generating process. And it's exactly the same reason was on the, on the graphs as well, right? There's, there's, there's confounders coming in. So basically the, the effect of C is confusing what's going on uh, when it comes to Y. And this is a really, really common problem uh, when it comes to working with data. And so if you guys uh, ever get to work with real world data, um, it's, I mean, real world data, 99% of it is what we refer to as observational data. It means that it was collected for some purpose other than you looking at it, right? So when the data was collected, uh, people weren't thinking about the analytics question or the model that you were gonna try and build. They were just collecting it for some other purpose, right? And this, is, this happens all the, all the time uh, in my day-to-day -day job. The other type of data that exists that can capture true causal relationships is normally known as randomized control trial data. So this is things like pharmaceutical trials. So you guys, I'm sure you're aware, um, pharma companies, before they're able to bring drugs to market, they have to run things known as uh, clinical trials. And these are all randomized to make sure that we get rid of this, this confoundedness. So basically this confoundedness is the thing that is causing um, us to get, see these, these false results. And so confoundedness is one of the big, big issues uh, that we face when working with machine learning. And it can really lead, as, I, as we just saw in the linear regression, right? It can really lead to the wrong answers. Um, there are other, questions, other problems as well about actually finding the true causal direction, which I'm not going to go into today, because what we're going to focus on is literally just one possible way of trying to solve and trying to work with real world data that actually you know, is going to be confounded and could potentially give us the wrong answer. Um, if we were to misunderstand what was going on. And with that, um, let me finally introduce uh, Bayesian networks, right? So um, a Bayesian network is just a type of graphical model, okay? Um, so it's what's known as a directed acyclic graph, so a DAG, 
And the directed bit basically means that, um, uh, so it's a graph, right? So it has uh, nodes and it has edges. And the directed bit means that the edges have an arrow on them. So there's actually a direction. And the whole idea is that the arrow is meant to represent the causal direction, okay? When we learn these things, we can't learn the true causal direction. Like a Bayesian network is not inherently causal, but I'll go into a few steps later as to how we can help make it causal, okay? So I, I don't wanna overpromise uh, the value of these things because uh, some people uh, think that you can get true causality just by using this Bayesian network. That's unfortunately not the case, uh, but they can help us, okay? Uh, let me just compare a Bayesian network very quickly to a linear regression, right? So everyone's familiar with linear regressions. Linear regressions have uh, lots of different assumptions and they're very different assumptions to a Bayesian network, okay? In a linear regression, we assume uh, that there is a target, okay? So in the problem that we just saw, uh, we were interested in Y as our target variable, okay? And linear regressions, they assume that all of the features, so all of the things going to the target are actually independent from each other, okay? So they assume that there's no relationship between these things, which, you know, as we saw from the true den gen true data generating process is not true, right? On the other hand, however, Bayesian networks don't make that assumption. Bayesian networks actually assume uh, that there are dependencies between all of the different nodes. And in fact, not every single data point that we collect needs to necessarily directly relate to the target, okay? And in fact, actually, um, if I just jump back uh, to the previous slide, you'll see that in fact, actually the graph is exactly the same, right? I, I, I cheated a little bit, I used exactly the same graph uh, to describe the data generating process. It was just a Bayesian network. Uh, one other thing to note is that a Bayesian network doesn't actually have the concept of a target variable. For a network, everything is just a node. It's what we are interested in is kind of like a down to the business problem that we're trying to solve for, uh, but it's not something that uh, the network itself actually needs to care about. And so that's actually getting close to the end of the slides that I wanted to talk through with you guys. I hope. Um, I hope people are not too lost with me so far. And that sort of like motivates why we might actually be interested uh, in, uh, in using a Bayesian network, right? Because they can help us get around some issues uh, that like something like confounders, uh, which is important if we, if we care about the causal relationship, right? We saw that the linear regression completely got the causal relationship wrong. They are a little bit more complicated, though, uh, to learn than a, than a regular model. So you guys who've been doing some, some machine learning or some data science beforehand, uh, you guys may have used sklearn, and you probably know that you can just uh, use an sklearn model. You can do dot fit. You can pass it some data. It will learn a relationship. And then you can do dot predict, and it will kind of like tell you the predictions back. Bayesian networks are a little bit more complicated. Okay, So we have to do uh, essentially one extra step. So the first thing that we have to do um, is we have to find the structure of the graph, okay? So the first thing that I'm gonna talk through with you guys uh, in the notebook in a second is gonna be actually all about the structure learning, okay? So finding this graphical structure. Once we've done this though, um, I said already that basically um, Bayesian networks are not inherently causal. And what, why we call this package, so this, this is the package that uh, in the introduction was mentioned that um, I, I came up with a few years ago now and it's kind of like was uh, developed further by, uh, by the rest of the firm. Um, why we call it causal next is because if we bring in a domain expert's expertise, um, we can change the graph and we can correct those causal edges and such that we, you know, we get a causal graph. So, the second step, once we've actually got our graph, is to just fit the probabilities. And this is exactly the same as what you would do in the sklearn models, right? So this is essentially the dot fit step. Um, and so kind of like this, this purple box here is essentially the extra thing that we have to do when working with a Bayesian network. Uh, this yellow box is very similar to the dot fit in a regular model. And then the last thing, once we've actually trained our model uh, that we get to do is the inference. And I don't know how much time we'll get uh, to talk about this today. Um, I hope I'll get to touch on it at the end. But again, Bayesian networks can do something slightly cool, which goes beyond the just the dot predict. And if we have time, um, I will get onto this a bit later. So, guys, um, I'm going to jump over to the notebook. Um, hopefully, um, if you uh, hopefully if you're interested, you were successful in uh, setting up the setting up the environment, uh, getting everything installed, and you would be able to load the notebook. So, this is the this is a notebook that was in the repository. Um, and so like the first few bits are very familiar because I've, I've just used most of them for the slides. 
Um, but basically, um, let me just talk you through all of the different, uh, talk you through these three steps, right? So let me talk you through the structural learning, uh, adjusting the graph, the likelihood estimation, and then if we have time, the counterfactual analysis as well. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna do to start with, uh, so we're just working in Python, right? So very simple Python and pandas to start with. Uh, we're gonna load all of the different uh, functions that we're gonna need from causal next. So this is the, uh, the Bayesian network package that we have. Uh, and it's and you guys may be familiar with something known as Network X. This is a very common uh, network uh, package in Python. Uh, so we do use this a lot as well to help with uh, plotting of the graphs and stuff. So to start with, we're just going to take some data. So we've got 33, uh, 33 columns in this data set. Uh, we've just taken the head of it, so we've just only got a sample of the rows here. Um, but the first thing that we're going to do, as I mentioned, is we're going to learn the structure. Okay. Um, so in causal next, uh, we implement something which is known as the no tiers algorithm. One of the reasons why Bayesian networks were really, really hard to use and hard to work with for a very long time. So Bayesian networks have actually been around since the 1980s. Uh, they were invented in, I think, 1988, if I remember correctly, by a guy called Judea Pearl. Uh, but no one used them. No one used them for like 20, 25 years. Um, and the reason is um, the structure was very, very hard to learn and very hard to recover. Uh, that was until uh, at NeurIPS, so one of the biggest uh, machine learning and data science conferences that there is in the world. Uh, at Neurips a couple of years ago, uh, there were some authors came out with this paper known as DAGs with no tiers. So DAGs being directed acyclic graphs. So kind of like a way to learn these, uh, these graphs. Um, and they proposed an approach which basically blew everything else out of, uh, out of the water. Um, and so since this, um, it has been possible to learn the graphs uh, a lot easier. And so this is what we implement inside Causal Next. Uh, we also, just a, a very quick plug, um, we also implement something known as Dino Tiers, which is something that, uh, oops, uh, something that my team came up with. Uh, so we actually worked with the author of this paper and we got this published as well in uh, AI Stats last year. Essentially, this is essentially implementing no tiers except for what's known as a dynamic Bayesian network. So this is a Bayesian network that varies by time. So it's not something I'm going to talk about today, uh, but something that uh, may, be may be interesting for anyone who ever wants to look at a time series problem, who wants to look at data through time. So the first thing about working with this no-tiers algorithm is that we essentially need to turn all of the data into numbers. Okay, so for, you see that we have a lot of categorical features as well. And what we want to do is essentially, we just want to label encode it, right? So uh, at this point, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not interested in fitting the probabilities yet. We just want to denote the different states. So all we have to do is label encode. And so all we do is we, we convert this into a, uh, a pandas data frame of just numerical values, okay? Then the next bit is just as simple as just using the function from, from, no, uh, from causal next. So we import uh, from pandas, so from uh, causal next structure, no tiers from pandas, and we, we essentially create what we refer to as a structure model, okay? So SM is standing for structure model. And what we can do is we can visualize this, right? Um, and so this is technically a graph, right? Technically. Um, there is a lot of edges though, okay? Far too many edges for this to be considered a interpretable graph by, by any stretch of the imagination, right? Um, basically, everything is connected to everything else. So there is something in the, in the notice algorithm um, that is, you can set a threshold, okay? And you can think of this threshold as being, okay, okay, whilst maybe everything could be connected, what are the interesting edges to make? Where does it actually have a, where does it make a difference if I was to join these two nodes, if I was to join these two variables, okay? And so this threshold is known as the W threshold. And essentially, if we were to set this and we were to say, okay, remove all of the edges below this threshold, we get a much sparser graph, okay? So far more highly interpretable because we can actually see it now. We can see what's going on. And we're left with the most important edges. So the, the relationship between higher, so this variable higher and this variable medu, the relationship here is stronger than all of these edges that got removed, okay? Um, and this is stronger in the statistical sense, right? So stronger in the sense that, um, you know, there, this, literally has a uh, stronger correlation. So at this stage, it is still just correlation, right? It's not causation. So if you were to dive into this graph, and I, I won't, we don't have the time to go through it in details, but basically we'd see that there's lots of these relationships that have been learned the wrong way around, right? So the directed edge should actually be flipped, okay? So the next thing that we have to do is we have to correct this, right? There's a couple of different ways to do it. 
you can actually, when you run the structure learning algorithm, you can actually ban certain edges from being learned in the first place. So if we wanted to say it's never possible to go from higher to medu, then we could actually add it into what's known as a taboo list. And then this was essentially, if you were to run it, it would ban that edge, right? So uh, higher and medu existed in the first one, right? Higher goes to medu. But in the second one, we've changed nothing else. Oh, no, we did. Oh, no, we didn't. Sorry, right? We, we've still got the uh, W threshold of 0.8. But now medu and higher have not been learned, right? So it's not allowed to learn. But aside from just banning edges, we can actually manually change them as well, right? So kind of like a, imagine you're working with someone or you, you know, maybe you understand the data and you, uh, you have some insights of your own that you want to, you know, you want to embed into the graph. We can manually actually set, we can add and we can remove edges. So you can get rid of them, you can flip them. As long as you essentially work, uh, end up with a, uh, a, an acyclic graph, okay? So we, we do need to check at the end, whatever we do. So here, sorry, let me scroll up again. Here we were adding some edges and here we were removing some edges Then we were plotting it again. Uh, then we wanted to remove all of these variables that we're not using, right? So all these things which are not related to anything else. So we just get the largest subgraph. Then essentially our final check to make sure that it is a valid Bayesian network is just to check that it is acyclic, okay? So um, that's the first bit, right? So this is the uh, this is the purple bit done. And now we're just gonna move on to the second step. So this is the step that normally doesn't exist when we're working with other machine learning things. We don't have this hybrid of looking at the data and manually editing parts of the graph, right? That doesn't happen when you're using linear regressions. It doesn't happen when you're using decision trees. You don't have an opportunity to change the tree or you don't have an opportunity to change the coefficient in a linear regression. Um, this is a bit unusual and it's a bit uh, unique to a, to a Bayesian network. The next bit is very simple. It's literally just fitting the probabilities. Okay, so uh, what we have to do, so um, in causal next, we don't use continuous variables. We only use discretized variables. So what we have to do to start with is we just have to decide how we're going to discretize things. And I'm gonna be honest, uh, the performance of your model will be dependent on how you discretize as well. So this is a very important step. I know it's just binning things, right? So you have your continuous variable and you decide that you want to set it into some sort of categories or classes. Um, so it, it's, it's very simple in, in many ways, but as you can see, if you use different methods, you would get different, different answers, right? You get different outputs. But essentially, once we've done the discretization, all we do is we do very standard data science things. We, we split it into a training set and a test set, and then we, we want to, um, basically fits the probabilities, okay? So uh, this is essentially the equivalent step to in sklearn doing dot fit, okay? So if you guys have used a model, imagine in sklearn, it, it will look just like this, right? Uh, what CPDS refers to is the conditional probability distribution uh, or distributions. Um, so the CPDS is because for every node that we have in our graphs, let me just go back up to our graph. So for every node we have, um, if we have an arrow pointing in, it means that the node above it is the parent, okay? So you can think of this as like a parent and a child relationship, right? So G2 is the parent of G3. And what happens in a Bayesian network is that each child is conditionally dependent on the parent node, okay? So if I was to look at G1, uh, because this is the node that I've got further down in the notebook, right? G1 is the child node of study time, uh, schools up, higher and failures, okay? So these are all of the parent nodes of G1. So if we were to look at the CPD of G1, which we can do, let me scroll back down here. So this is the CPD of G1. You can see here that failures, higher, schools up, study time, the same four parents, right? And these, these parents have different states. So it's either have failure or no failure for failures. Higher is either no or yes, and we need to have it twice, right? Because we've got failure and fail failures above. Stools up is also only no or yes. And then study time is either long or short. And you can see that all we're learning and all we're fitting is essentially probabilities, right? So the probability of G1 being fail, given that failures was had a previous failure, higher was no, stools up was no, and study was long time, probability of failure was 0.75. Probability of failure, given all of these things, but also study short time increases, right? So probability increases from 0.5 to 0.8, okay? Sorry, 0.75 to 0.8. And so 
when we're doing, uh, when we're fitting the probabilities, it's just either maximum likelihood estimation. So um, I'm sure you guys will probably have heard of this, or it's something known as Bayesian estimization. So kind of like a, it's just fitting to the data, trying to find what is the best probability uh, that we can uh, fit to our model. I'm just seeing a couple of questions. So let me try and uh, tackle some of the questions as well as we go. Um, so is the discretization for optimization purposes? Um, not quite. Um, so if you were to not, so, okay, technically it is possible to have a Bayesian network which doesn't use discretized data. Um, if you do that though, you have to assume that your data is uh, Gaussianly distributed, okay? So that you, everything can be modeled as a normal. And then the parameters that you pass around are essentially the mean and the standard deviation or the variance um, of that distribution. Um, and these are the things that get propagated around the model. So it is possible uh, to use continuous, um, but the problem is um, most real world data is not actually a normal distribution, right? Very, very rarely do you, do you actually get a normal distribution in the data. So the reason why we use dis discrete data is not, not because of any optimization, it's purely because real world data isn't normal. And so uh, we can't fit the assumptions of using a continuous Bayesian network. Um, and then is discretization the same as histograms? Um, so histograms, I guess, is a way of visualizing uh, bucketing. Um, so um, discretization basically just means taking a continuous variable, so kind of like a set of numbers and grouping them into classes, right? So imagine that I've got uh, a number line like zero to a hundred, and I want to discretize it into 10 discrete buckets, I might choose to do zero to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's what I mean by uh, discretization. A histogram is a histogram is essentially a visualization of, of discretization. Of your, uh, your, it is related. Okay, um, so then we, uh, so now we fit the probabilities, right? We've trained our model at this stage, um, we have our model in memory and we can use it to make predictions. But in a Bayesian network, um, we can do so, okay, so we can say, okay, let's use it to make a prediction. And because it's, because it's discrete classes, right? Essentially what we've built is a classification model, okay? And the way that we uh, can assess the performance of a Bayesian network is just using like very, very standard uh, classification metrics. So I don't know how familiar you guys are with different classification metrics, but there's things like Rock AUC, uh, they've got precision, recall, F1 score, et cetera. There's lots and lots of different metrics that you can use to assess the performance of a classifier uh, for, your, uh, for Rock AUC. So this is the receiver operating curve area under the curve. Um, basically, this is a scale between, well, technically it's a scale between zero, uh, zero and one, but basically the, it's, it's really between 0.5 and 1, because if you're less than 0.5, you are worse than a, you're predicting worse than a flip of a coin. Um, so here to get a 0.92 as your performance, that's very close to 1. This is very good, right? So basically, our, our model is performing pretty well. So now we've trained the model, we actually want to use it. And um, I, I'm going to slow down a little bit at this point because um, there is a big difference about how Bayesian networks work, which I think is pretty cool uh, compared to regular machine learning. Okay, so in a regular machine learning, you remember we had like the y equals uh, f of x, right? And so we uh, were just used to kind of like trying to steal uh, the relationship that. Um, sorry, we're just used to. Uh, Try train the model. So we, we learn the relationship between, oops, sorry, let me go back a slide. Uh, we want to learn this relationship. So we have our features, we have our target variable, and uh, we have whatever model we're using. And when we want to make a prediction, we just put in new values of X, and then the, the, the model that we've learned will give us new values of Y, right? And that's how we would normally use, uh, normally use regular machine learning model, whether or not it was a causal question. Okay, but in a causal question, so imagine when we're using a Bayesian network, we actually can do some smarter things uh, because we have the causal edges encoded into the graph, right? So our model is gonna respect uh, these edges in some way. And so I'm gonna uh, try and explain the difference between something known as observations as opposed to interventions, okay? Um, so hopefully you guys are also uh, familiar with like Bayesian statistics a little bit. So the whole idea behind, sorry, I need to stop doing that. The whole idea behind Bayesian statistics is that we can 
um, we can have what's known as prior information and we can have like a prior probability. But as we learn more information, as we gather more information, we can update our belief about what should the probability be, okay? And this is very different to what's known as frequentist statistics, right? So hypothesis testing, so like kind of like doing like a student's t-test, et cetera, et cetera. All these things are normally to do with frequentist statistics. And so you guys at school have probably learned like Bayes' rule. Um, it may be maybe a long time ago, but like most people I'm sure will have done Bayes' rule. Um, Bayesian networks basically work off Bayes' rule, where the idea is that if we get new information, we can incorporate it into our model. So let me just like try and demonstrate with a with a simple example, right? Uh, in fact, actually, let me maybe use the simple example in the slides because I think it will be a little bit easier. Uh, okay, here we are. Okay, so it's actually the same example to start with. So same, same example, right? So we've just got a, a very small Bayesian network and we're gonna do something known as observing to start with, right? So this is, um, imagine we've got two neighbors, so like Holmes and Watson, and they have houses next to each other and they've got uh, grass outside their house. And so uh, we have a system where if it rains, then you know probably Watson and Holmes's grass is gonna be more likely to be wet but Holmes also has a sprinkler system, okay? So he has a sensor which detects whether it's raining or not, and then he has a sprinkler that will come on and can also cause his grass to be wet. So because we're, we're working with this Bayes rule, right? So the idea is that we have some probabilities which we just fit from the data, okay? So we just take the, take the historical data and we fit, we fit the CPDs just like we saw. Um, if we were to observe though that Watson's grass was wet, we've actually learned something about the state of the system. Okay, so we've not done anything, right? We've just seen, we've just observed that Watson's grass is wet. And because it's observational, essentially what we can do is we can propagate that information. So we can push that information up and we can push it back into its reins and then it will, it will propagate downwards and it will update the probability of Holmes's grass being wet as well. Okay, so because, so you can think of this as like a causal statement as well, right? Because Watson's grass is wet, Holmes's grass is also most likely to be wet. Okay, so this is definitely answering a causal question. Okay, let me show you a different example now. Let's imagine that we do something different. Let's imagine that we go along with a watering can uh, and we actually make Watson's grass wet. Okay, so if we were to do it, We've not seen it anymore. We've not observed it. We've actually actively changed something, right? What happens in the Bayesian network now that doesn't happen in any other kind of machine learning or any other sort of model is we actually change the graph. So because we've done this, we're not able anymore to propagate that information back up, right? Because we have done this. And so it tells us absolutely nothing about whether it was raining or not. You know, we could have gone and watered the grass uh, uh, when it was dry or when it was raining. And so this is very, very, very different, but it's very, very powerful as well, because Bayesian networks are basically the only, only type of model that does this. So you can see there's a distinct difference between this and the previous slide, okay? And so basically, if we were to do something here, these nodes don't care, right? There's no effect whatsoever about uh, whether Holmes's grass is wet or not. It can, it can have an effect though. So this is why it's, um, this is why I use it in my day-to-day -day job. And this is kind of like how people uh, use Bayesian networks in the real world. Essentially, imagine we manually turned Holmes's sprinkler on. Now it tells us nothing about the sensor. It still tells us nothing about the rain and it tells us nothing about Watson's grass, but it does propagate the information downwards. So whilst we, it's called mutilating the graph. So whilst we mutilate the graph and we change the graph to remove any of the edges for the, uh, for the nodes which are coming in, so any of the parent nodes of this child node, we remove this edge, but we can still update the information and we can still learn something about downstream, okay? So this is, this is slightly different to doing predictions um, like we would um, in like sklearn with regular models, right? So this is, this is very, uh, a bit more complicated but also a bit more powerful because essentially it gets us a little bit closer to what is really going on uh, in real world data with real world problems. And so let me just go through the last few slides on the notebook and then I'll sum up uh, and hopefully, I, uh, yeah, just be a couple more minutes. So basically um, 
The way that we do this in causal nets is we instantiate an object known as the inference engine. So we convert the Bayesian network that we've, uh, that we've created and we convert it into this inference engine object. And then what we can do is we can get out the probabilities. So the probabilities um, are known as marginals. So the marginal probability basically means it's not conditioned on anything anymore. So it's not probability of A conditioned on B, C, D, it's just the probability of A. So we get out the marginal probabilities and we can update them. So the way that we do the observational, so the observational, remember, is, is this one, right? The way that we do the observational is essentially we, uh, we just pass into the query and we say, oh, here we are, sorry. We say, okay, I have observed that the variable study time is short. Or here, I have observed that the variable study time is long. Okay, and then we can see how does this change? How does this update the probabilities? Okay, so actually, if I study for a short time, my probability of passing is 0.72. If I, if I study for a long time, my probability of passing increases, right, to 0.84. And then we have the intervention one as well. So this is, the, uh, this, is this case, right, So we, where we actually do something. Um, the way that we do this is it's, again, quite simple. We say do intervention, and then we can say, okay, what I want to intervene on is the node higher, and I want to set it to yes, one, and no, zero. So change all of the probability to one, and all of the probability here to zero. And again, we will update the probability. So right, so we can kind of like look at the distribution. So we just call the marginal probability distribution, and we can see before, and we can see after, and we can see that the um, the oh well yeah obviously it changes right because we're looking at the same variable. <laughs> uh, but if we were to look at a different variable as well, so let's let's look let's look at G one instead. You can see that also um, also the probability updates right. So I know that's a very whistle-stop tour, guys, and uh, we're basically out of time, but I just want to just leave you with two final slides um, and just talk you through why I think this is uh, quite important and quite cool, or just to summarize as well. Um, so Bayesian networks are a, just a particular class of machine learning model uh, that we can use, we can, we can apply to data, just as we would any other type of machine learning model. Uh, the benefits of them are essentially that they are reasonably interpretable, um, but they are all also smarter and more performant uh, on average than a linear regression or something else that is also interpretable. Um, they are not, however, um, uh, inherently causal, right? So kind of like you do have to do some work to make them causal, that you don't get it for free. Um, but it is possible because all you have to do is essentially edit and adjust uh, the uh, the edges and the direction of the edges in the graph that you learn. And then the final, I think, pro side is that, um, you know, we can do this smarter counterfactual analysis, which, which does the things like the differentiating between doing something and observing something, which is very, very, uh, pretty unique, if I'm honest. So then final slide, and then I'm done. Um, so hopefully uh, the, the sense that I was trying to get across was that uh, when working with machine learning, when working with data, when like building uh, building models, if we want to use that model to make a decision, then normally people will expect the model to actually make causal sense. Okay, and so whilst a lot of the data that we have to work on is known as observational data, um, it's not normally possible to get the true sense of causality um, out of um, out of uh, observational data. But using a Bayesian network, we can get better. Okay, so I'm not going to say that like it solves all problems. Uh, it doesn't. It still can be quite hard, uh, but it makes it uh, it makes it in some way possible to model these causal relationships. Um, so other than that, guys, um, happy to take any questions. Uh, I think there's a about uh, 13 minutes. I see there's one on the uh, oh, there's a couple on the chat already. So let me let me just go through some of the questions on the chat. Um, how does okay? So how does how do we perform inference? So it's actually not a sampling based approach. Um, so a propagating information around a Bayesian network is actually a deterministic process. Um, so underneath the Bayesian network, uh, oh well, sorry, no, that's, that's not true. It's not underneath the Bayesian network. Uh, the way that information propagates around the Bayesian network is using something known as the junction tree algorithm, the J J T A. Uh, and essentially what the junction tree algorithm does is it forms what's known as a clique tree. Uh, and the clique tree is essentially the way to uh, tell the network how to update, which, which nodes to update, which nodes not to update based on the different things like the, 
uh, well, like things known as like the backdoor criteria and frontdoor criteria, it gets a little bit complicated, if I'm honest. Um, it is possible to do certain uh, interventional things using sampling techniques, but you don't have to, basically, is what I'm saying, using a Bayesian network, because it will do it for you uh, deterministically. Um, and then next question, uh, would you always recommend Bayesian over linear regression? Good question. Um, I'm a little bit biased, right? Because I have spent four years of my life um, kind of like doing a PhD and um, working a lot with Bayesian networks. So I am biased and take everything I say with a bit of a pinch of salt. Um, I hope I gave you a, uh, uh, hopefully like a balanced view as to like, you know, they're not the perfect model, right? Um, I think that if you've got lots and lots and lots and lots of continuous data, and you've got lots of things, lots of factors, lots of features that are truly independent of each other, then there's actually probably nothing wrong with a linear regression, okay? Don't, like linear regressions are very important models. They're, they're like pretty fundamental in some ways. They're, they're normally like the baseline model. They, they're pretty basic, but they've got lots of assumptions. And if you obey those assumptions, at least, then they can perform very well. The problem is that the assumptions of linear regression, like the independence of features and the fact that your data like is normally distributed, and then you have like normal relation, linear relations between the features and the targets, it's actually very hard to satisfy these, these criteria with normal data. If you're not working with uh, real world data though, maybe a linear regression is okay. Um, and then what are the main applications of BNs? Um, so honestly, it can be anything, right? So I, I'm just going to show you one example. Um, it's also in the workbook, but let me just uh, very quickly talk, talk with you through uh, this slide. Basically, any time that you want to make an interpretable model, uh, though I'm glad that you uh, I'm glad you said medicine because this is kind of a, a medical sort of example. Um, any time you want to use a uh, to explain the model and provide like an interp interpretable model, then I think the ends can be appropriate. Um, this is an example that I did with a client a couple of years ago now. Um, it is on purpose slightly wrong. Let me just say that to start with, because we're not allowed to share the real network. But essentially what this is mapping is lots of different variables uh, where the target variable of interest was what was known as a myocardial infarction. And this is basically uh, a heart attack. Right. So what we were looking at is like what what are lots of different um, uh, characteristics of the patient. So things like gender, age, where do they live, et cetera, et cetera. Different characteristics versus different comorbidities, different diseases that they've got. So kind of like, do they have heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. What do they do? So you can see and lots of people like seeing the story that you can pull out of a Bayesian network as well. Right. So you can tell a story where you say, OK, yes, yeah, so sure. So smoking has links with obesity. Obesity and diabetes are linked. Um, smoking can lead to respiratory disease. Respiratory disease can lead to respiratory failure, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Respiratory failure can lead to people being hospitalized more and more, et cetera, et cetera. A linear regression would try and learn the relationship between all of these, like, what is it, 25, 30 variables, um, and directly the, the myocardial infarction, right? Whereas here in the Bayesian network, actually, we can see that maybe not everything is directly related. You know, it makes sense that maybe respiratory disease leads to respiratory failure, which leads to things which leads to it, right? So it doesn't have to necessarily be directly related. Um, and the other thing that you can see here, the reason why some of the arrows are darker and bigger than others is that we've essentially like colored them in thicker if the relationship is stronger. And the reason why we do this is because if there's a really weak relationship and we want to propose one of these interventions that I was talking about, it doesn't make any sense really to intervene on something where there's a really weak relationship because it basically means that you can change it all you want, the impact will be really small. So um, people are quite often interested to see like the strength of the relationship between, uh, between these nodes as well. And so this is just, this is one example. And yes, it is, it is sort of like a, a medical example, but I mean, I've applied these in financial service. I, I do a lot of work um, at Quantum Black um, in the pharmaceutical space. And I also do it in the financial services space. And I've applied it in both, if I'm honest. The other thing that we do, so kind of like just to, you know, um, this is just visualizing the uh, visualizing the graph, right? But to do these observations and these interventions means that we can then kind of like create stories, right? So um, imagine like we have, uh, we've got this patient and we observe that she is a smoker. Her BMI is 32, she's 50, and she has this particular disease, PAD, pulmonary artery disease. Um, she gets older, so we can update. Uh, we can update our observations. So she's got older. She's now got diabetes. We've, ob we've observed this. She's got older again, and she's 
uh, we've observed that she's developed symptoms of heart failure. And so kind of like the probabilities will change. So obviously here, there must be a very small impact of diabetes in our graph. So diabetes didn't really play a part, uh, but heart failure did. And we can see that the probability of her having a heart attack increases. But then what we do is we intervene. Okay, so uh, she's got older. So we've observed that she's got older, but we've intervened and she stopped smoking and she's lost weight, right? So we've intervened. So when we do this, the, the network again updates, et cetera. So hopefully that answers the question of uh, main applications. I think kind of uh, basically anything that is uh, interpretable uh, could, be, could be seen as an application. When a BN is not appropriate for use. Okay, so if you want something that is super, 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 super high performant, inevitably when we are discretizing our data, uh, we lose information, right? So kind of the amount of information that is available when we uh, bucket the data and we discretize it, is far less than if it was a continuous distribution, okay? So we do lose information here. And inevitably then um, the, and also uh, Bayesian networks tend to have fewer features, right? So we only, we only look to kind of like use, you know, features which on a graph that we can still interpret, right? So we don't want really like hundreds and hundreds of features, maybe like around 30 is probably about your max, right? So if you wanted a really, really, really performant model where performance was the only thing you cared about, then discretizing your data and limiting the number of features that you use would probably be not a good idea, right? So in such an instance, a Bayesian network probably wouldn't be appropriate. The other instance, at least using causal nets, if you decide to use causal nets with discrete data, if you really need your output to be a continuous variable, then that's also wouldn't be appropriate, right? So if you need your target variable output for your prediction to be continuous, also probably uh, not appropriate then. And then there's there's lots of cases where we simply can't use a Bayesian network as well, right? So I'd like to go back to uh, to go back to uh, this slide here. Um, we a Bayesian network can't really be help that can't really help you with a, pre a prescriptive case, right? With an optimization problem, it can only really help with the predictive and the descriptive problems, where we we can use it to make predictions and we can use it to understand and explain the relationships. Uh, but it's not it's not an optimization technique, etc. And then, uh, does it work with variable data like buying patterns? Ah, okay. Um, so for this, this is like temporal data, right? Um, so data that changes over time uh, is like time series data. And for this, you can make it work, but you need the extension that I mentioned, which is the dynamic Bayesian networks. So the dynamic Bayesian networks is the bit that uh, the QB team actually wrote the paper for. Uh, so let me uh, try to find it. So it's this one. Um, so this is uh, so it is possible um, to uh, to learn time series data and which could maybe get like buying patterns etc. You could also probably pose your buying patterns as a um, as a very different type of problem as well though right if 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 you're thinking like recommendations based on what have people bought previously then I would probably be thinking more things like matrix factorization or like a priori algorithm association rule mining stuff rather than a Bayesian network. But you can you can model it as a Bayesian network if you had like maybe you know the different products that people were potentially interested in buying as a uh, as separate nodes in your graph. So it could work, but uh, I think it honestly it would depend on the problem a little bit. Cool. Can we update among the observations from the same individual over time? Yes, for sure. Absolutely no rules against that in the slightest. I think kind of like a as long as you set your unit analysis to be the fact that, you know, and the, the use of the model is understood that you would be uh, updating that. Um, I think you could do it in two different ways. Either you include them as separate entries, or uh, you could actually probably use the Bayesian estimation, uh, Bayesian estimation way to populate the probabilities where you keep your prior from that particular individual as to you know what was their previous uh, information and then you you feed it the new information and you get it to update the probability that way um so yeah so i think you, you definitely can um a couple of different ways to to probably make it work cool uh okay final question is it possible to convert high performance models that aren't very interpretable into Bayesian networks to make it much more interpretable? It is, uh, but you would drop performance, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, because I mean every every model will have different assumptions and kind of like many models wouldn't have uh, this um, this concept of a graph. Um, 
And so uh, converting a more high performance model where you maybe select the features that your high performance model is using, and then you try and train your uh, Bayesian network on the same features and you see what relationships it learns, inevitably they will give you different results, right? Because they're different models and they will have different assumptions. Uh, but you could do it. And I've also, I have done that on previous projects as well, where essentially you use your high performing model for your main predictions, but you use your Bayesian network as your explanation tool. And yes, they do differ a little bit, but as long as they roughly line up, um, you can sort of like use them as triangulation points. So uh, to try and, um, uh, you know, show that they agree, even though they're different models, all models are going to give you different results if you, if you use two different models, different assumptions. Uh, but if they agree, if they align with each other, then yes. But I, I would expect a drop in performance. <laughs> it, they they won't be as they won't be as performant as something like cat boosts, XG boosts, neural nets, etc. Did I work with macro random fields? Any reasons to choose undirected graphical or a, a graphical one? So I have done some macro stuff before. Um, the you can you. If you use an undirected graphical model, there are certain uh, evidence propagation things that you can't do. Um, and that's, that's what basically breaks a Bayesian network. And that's why Bayesian networks have to be DAGs. They have to be directed. I don't believe, uh, though I could be wrong, but I don't believe that there is a way to propagate the evidence around in the same way. Uh, that's why you would have to do like a sampling approach uh, if you're doing like a Markov model. Though I could be wrong on that. It's not, I'm not going to claim that's my, my strength area, but I think that's why people would have to do it. Okay. I think I'm at time, guys. I have one, one final, final plug. Um, so this is a, the second open source tool that Quantum Black released. And we are very, very happy that we've got like 1.3 thousand people who've uh, previously like starred our repository on GitHub. Uh, we're trying to get it to 2,000. If you wouldn't mind, if you like, if you like the tool, if you ever intend on using it, uh, please do consider uh, giving us a star. Uh, we'd much appreciate it. Other than that, uh, please feel free uh, reach out to me if any questions in the future. Uh, like feel free to email, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, happy to answer any questions about Bayesian networks. Happy to answer any questions about Quantum Black. Other than that, thank you guys. Thank you for taking the time uh, uh, this evening uh, to listen to me, and I'll hand back uh, to the NUS Hackers team. Thank you, Paul. Now we'll have the second speaker. I'm sorry, let me share my screen regarding the speaker profile. So the second talk will be safe at any speed during a a performance, safe, and maintainable packet processor. So the speaker um, is Malcolm Carrots. He, and he earned his BS and MS in computer science from the University of Melbourne, Australia. Since 2019, Malcolm has been a software developer at Jane Street in Hong Kong, where he works on frameworks, tools, and infrastructure for developing, running, and monitoring high-performance trading systems. Let's welcome him. Thank you, Ashley. Can you hear me okay? Good, I can hear you. Perfect. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen then. All right, can we all see the slides? Yep. Okay. okay. Good. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Malcolm. I, I work at Jane Street, Hong Kong, and this talk's called Safe at Any Speed, and I'm going to be talking uh, about performance, about writing high-performance uh, systems at Jane Street, and how we think about writing performance systems. So the talk's going to be um, a bit of a walkthrough of designing a particular system uh, that does a very specific thing, um, and it's going to be a packet processing system. Um, so it's going to be, we're going to be looking at like single core performance of this, this, this process that consumes market data, um, which is data from the market, from an exchange, 
and uh, we'll, we'll get more into that. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a walk through designing this system. Um, to give you some context first, though, uh, I want to give you a little picture of the world and uh, an important concept um, that we think about when writing performance systems at Jane Street. So what we call the, the hot path, this is the really latency critical part of our systems, um, is this loop from market data to sending orders back to the exchange. Um, the part we're gonna be focusing on is this market data processor. So this is, this is a, uh, an application that consumes a stream of data from the exchange and delivers it to various clients around the firm. Um, so not all of those clients really care about latency, but some of them certainly do, um, in particular trading strategies. So there's obviously a lot more to this picture. Um, lots of applications around, uh, around Jane Street and lots of clients internally that care about receiving this data. Um, but the, what we refer to as the hot path or the critical path are the ones that really, really care about latency. And that path in general is not only um, you know, a loop through certain applications, but even within an application, uh, certain parts of the application are gonna be more important than others. And that hot path is gonna be the part that runs most frequently um, uh, near, during normal operation. For example, you don't have to be as concerned with performance when you're hand handling errors. Um, and there's obviously a lot more instances of all these trading strategies, lots of clients that care about getting this data. Um, so just for a second, uh, I want to talk about what this talk's not about, because there's a lot of things that we could talk about when we're talking about performance. We're going to talk about some specific things. Uh, so this talk's not about choosing efficient algorithms. It's not really about um, optimizing hardware. Um, not about exploiting parallelism. And it's not really going to be a comparison of languages. Um, at Jane Street, we use our camel for almost everything. Um, you might ask a question like, why don't we use C++ for certain high performance things or C or hand code um, assembly? And we certainly do some of that sometimes, but this talk is gonna be focusing on OCaml. And I think the point of it is not that you should use OCaml uh, for high performance things, but just that you can. And hopefully some of the lessons learned uh, in this story are applicable to other languages that are similar to OCaml in certain ways, um, like, like Java, for example. Okay, so here's the outline of the talk. Um, first, I'm gonna, I'm gonna motivate the, the, the problem, the application. Um, we're gonna talk about what market data is and how much of it, how much of it there is and why that is a high performance uh, application. And then we're gonna get to some OCaml specific stuff. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, OCaml at a high level and some of the things about OCaml under the hood which are important to understand when you're trying to squeeze out as much performance as you can. Um, then we're gonna talk about some specific coding paradigms in OCaml specifically uh, and their performance impact and maybe some alternatives when you're writing very performance sensitive code. And then at the end, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna see some demo code uh, for this packet processing system that we're walking through. Okay, so what's market data? Um, well, the main job of an exchange is to keep this data structure uh, called a book, which holds information about who is willing to buy and sell uh, every security um, at, at which prices they're willing to do so. Um, so just as an example, let's imagine Jane Street, sends an order to sell a certain security. Um, the exchange needs to update the book accordingly and keep that on their book um, to execute potential trades in the future. And on the other side of this, um, the exchange needs to provide market data to the world. And this is so that anybody, any market participant can follow along, build their own 
uh, model of what's happening in the market and, um, and, and make decisions about how they want to trade. Um, so a key thing about this market data stream uh, that the world sees is that it's anonymized. Um, that's not really important from a technical point of view, but um, people get to follow along with which orders are happening in the market, but not necessarily like who exactly is willing to buy or sell something. So imagine uh, Goldman Sachs comes along and submits a buy order. And if that trades with our order that was previously sitting on the book, the world gets to know that a trade happened, but they don't get to know exactly who traded. So the question we need to ask when we're designing this market data system is uh, how, how fast do we need to be? And maybe it's important to know like how much data there is. Um, so let's look at NASDAQ, it's one of the biggest exchanges in the world. Um, it produces about 1 billion messages per day of, uh, of market data. Um, and the close right before the end of trading every day is typically the most busy time. There's about three to 4 million messages right before 4 p.m. Uh, not a lot of trading happens after 4 p.m., but right before the close tends to be the busiest time of day. Um, there are dozens more equity exchanges in the US. Uh, there's lots more worldwide. And not only are there um, equity exchanges, but there are many derivatives markets, for example, options and futures. And um, there's the point is there's a lot of data. Um, to consume about all the trading that's happening in the world. So how fast do we need to be? This is this slide is a little bit of an aside. Um, it's just some scales, uh, some different time scales. Um, so the smallest unit here, we've got picoseconds, um, which is the, according to Wikipedia, the <laughs> fastest switching time of a transistor. Um, but that, we've got some hundreds of picoseconds, which is about one cycle on a modern CPU. Um, single digit nanoseconds, about light traveling uh, on a fiber optic cable a few meters. Uh, 50 microseconds, this would be the internal latency of the NASDAQ. And um, single digit milliseconds is about the time it takes for light to travel um, between Shanghai and Beijing, for example. And a blink of an eye, it's about 300 milliseconds. Um, so the kind of timescales we're gonna be talking about um, in this talk are sort of around this range from the from nanoseconds to the like single digit milliseconds. Okay. Um, before I move on, I just wanna, it's worth saying that um, Jane Street is like, we don't consider ourselves a high frequency trading firm. And that, that's to say that we don't think being fast is our primary um, source of value, but as the market, um, the market gets busier, faster, um, it just, to stay operational, uh, to compete, um, we kind of have to, have to be fast sometimes. Okay, so how fast would we like to be? Well, roughly we'd like to process all the market data as it comes from the market in real time. And at the busiest time, which as I said, is around the closing time, um, we, we don't wanna fall behind. We wanna keep up with the, with the real time market data uh, all the time. Okay, so this is um, a little experiment. We're gonna like look at some data here. Um, these rows here, as we go down, um, down the rows, where we're going through time. And you can see 4, 4 p.m. is right here. This is the close of the NASDAQ. And um, each column here is going to be a sort of experiment um, where imagine if we had a constant um, packet processing time. Um, what would be the maximum length of the queue of messages. Like if we're processing slightly slower than the messages are arriving, we're gonna have to queue some messages. Um, so you can see if, if we were processing at 750 nanoseconds per message, um, at this time in the previous 10 seconds, we would have had a maximum of 22 messages in the queue. 
Okay, um, that's what that means. And if we look at the full table, um, we can see some interesting things. So right around the close, the busiest time, we can see some of these queues are getting very long. Around this one microsecond time, it seems like we're queuing a lot of messages. Um, and after that, uh, it seems to resolve a little bit. It seems to go back to normal. Um, but in particular, when we get around 10 microseconds, you can see we're really, really falling behind here. Um, so this is 20 seconds after the close. And in that period, we had about half a million messages in our queue. So we're, we're really, really falling behind. Um, 10 seconds after the, after the close, we're still working on like those first few messages and there's hundreds of thousands left to process. So that's not really good. Um, this is the same data in a different view. So um, as time to process a message increases on the x-axis, um, this is the maximum queue length on the y-axis. And you can see this area around here, this 750 nanos to one microsecond um, is sort of a key area. And any, anything after that is terrible. So um, we kind of have a, a ballpark range for where we'd like to be, and it would be under 750 nanoseconds. Okay, so I've talked about um, why we need to be fast and how fast exactly we need to be. Um, but in general, when we're building systems, we always want them to be highly flexible and extendable and maintainable. And what do I mean by that? Well, like um, we'd like as much of our code to be reused as possible because this is a system that's gonna be talking to exchanges outside our walls. So we're consuming data um, from exchange and every exchange um, may implement a slightly different protocol. They may have slightly different nuances to the way they deliver their market data. Um, things can change over time. Maybe a new regulation is passed and, and uh, the markets have to react to that. And we wanna be able to react to that as quickly as possible too. So uh, keeping like the complexity of the outside world, things that can change, uh, separate from the things um, that aren't going to change, which is just our high performance code, um, keeping those things separate is really important. And um, even when we're trying to write things as fast as possible, uh, we really want to make sure that they're, they're still flexible and maintainable so that developers can go in there and make those changes. Okay, so those are our goals um, for our system. Um, we're going to get to some OCaml specific stuff now. Uh, maybe I should ask if anybody has any questions at this point. Maybe I can have I can keep an eye on the chat, perhaps. Um, there's nothing in there. But... Okay. Um, so OCaml, as some of you might know, is a functional language with a strong static type system. Um, with good support for imperative programming as well. So what this means is it has all the nice things like higher order functions, um, type inference, um, immutability by default, but it also, it also has support for standard imperative programming uh, with mutable, mutable values uh, as well. It's a garbage collected language. Um, this is gonna be really important for the rest of the talk. Um, it's an important property of, of, of the language in general. Uh, it means that it's generally much more memory safe than uh, something lower level. Um, but we, we'll, we'll come back to garbage collection. It's gonna be important in, when, when we're writing a uh, performance code. We're getting a little bit into the weeds here under the hood of OCaml, but um, in general, OCaml has two types of values, um, and it's not, it's not too dissimilar from, from Java. So uh, there are immediate values, uh, like integers, um, and these are things that can be just stored in registers, um, stored on the stack, uh, and, 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 and then it has boxed values, and these are things that are dynamically allocated on the heap, and they're usually passed around as pointers. Um, so in general, 
immediates are fast and box values are kind of slow. And, and the box values are the things that are going to need to be garbage collected. Um, another important thing is OCaml has really good support for pulling external functions, um, particularly in C, um, in a pretty like low overhead way. And uh, once you've written your uh, OCaml interfaces, it's quite, quite convenient to program with these external um, C code. Okay, that's OCaml in a nutshell. Now we're gonna look at some specific uh, coding paradigms in OCaml. So here is some pretty typical idiomatic OCaml code. Um, if you haven't seen OCaml before, I hope it's not too hard to understand. This is a function. Uh, it takes two arguments, a multiplier and an input list. And then what we're going to do is we're going to map over the list. So we're transforming it uh, in subsequent steps. First, we're going to multiply each element uh, by the multiplier and then round the element and then do something arbitrary at the end. Um, like I said, this is, this is really simple idiomatic code. Um, this is totally fine to write in almost all applications, but um, the thing is, this is an instance of what we call garbagey programming. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to allocate a lot of short-lived values that are like immediately thrown away. We're going to map over the list, multiply everything, that produces a new list. Um, then we're going to map over the list again, around everything, it produces another list. Um, and every time we allocate, we're, we're creating garbage. These are values that, when they're not used anymore, they're thrown away. They need to be collected. Um, so this is, one, this, is, this is an important thing to think about when we're writing performance code. So why is this, why is this slow? Well, it's not the allocation uh, itself. Allocation is usually pretty fast. Um, but garbage collection can be slow. Um, and why is it slow? Well, um, the OCaml garbage collector uh, and uh, most other garbage collectors as well, um, they interrupt your program. And the OCaml, the OCaml garbage collector is what we call a stop the world garbage collector, where it's going to hold your program and you can't do any work while the garbage collector is working. And then when the garbage, garbage collector is done, uh, your program resumes. Um, so that's not good. It's, it, it makes it slow. And it's also a little bit non-deterministic because this, this we're sort of at the mercy of the garbage collector and it happens um, you know, not completely in our control. Um, and that's not good. We want really consistent performance in a, in a really critical system like this. Um, you might think that uh, the garbage collector is, is it's going to kick in sometimes. It's going to slow us down occasionally. So we might have this like long tail of um, of latencies in our distribution, but it's actually not that simple. And it's a little worse than that because um, when the garbage collector runs, it needs to load certain things into caches. Um, you know, the, you, your machine has certain levels of cache, L1, L2, L3, and um, the garbage collector is going to kick out some of your values from cache. It's going to load some things into cache, and it's going to make your whole program less cache efficient in general. Um, so that's that's not so good. <laughs> so so if uh, if allocating is slow and we want to avoid the garbage collector, what do we do? Well, um, we can just never allocate anything. Um, that's the rough idea, uh, at least not in the critical path. So. In this path where the speed is most critical and needs to be most consistent, we avoid allocations. Um, how do we do that? Well, in general, uh, you can prefer using immediates over box values. Um, so wherever, instead of allocating like a struct or a record, you could use um, just some, some integers, right? Um, you could pre-allocate a bunch of stuff at the start of your program. So we don't want to do dynamic allocation in the hot path while the program's running, but it's fine to allocate things at the beginning of the program. And you can sort of pull these data structures um, and reuse them um, and mutate them um, throughout the program's life. Um, yeah. Um, and one thing we could do 
is we can we can use the external uh, external C code to allocate memory outside of the OCaml's runtime, right? So the OCaml OCaml has a um, it has a heap where it allocates things. It's just a, a section of memory, and the garbage collector goes through and it scans values in the heap looking for garbage. But if you if you call like out, out to some external C code uh, and you allocate memory outside of that area, it's outside of the view of the OCaml garbage collector. Um, and if you're really clever, you can sort of allocate a C struct and lay it out in a way that looks like an OCaml value. And then you can handle it in your code as if it were a native OCaml value, but it's outside the view of the garbage collector. Um, so you don't pay that cost of, of garbage collection. Um, and yeah, we, we have libraries. Uh, we have libraries for doing this, uh, for allocating pools of these resources and, and reusing them. Um, okay. We're gonna go through, uh, so we talked about this, this high level concept of garbage programming and in general, what we can do about it. We're gonna look at some specific examples now. So this is the option type um, in OCaml. We love the option type um, because it forces you to think about when something can be present or when it can be absent. In OCaml, uh, a value of, of some type is, is guaranteed to be a valid value of that type. Like even these boxed values that are in fact pointers to, to some structure, um, they can never be null as long as they were created like within OCaml. Um, if something can be null, um, you're gonna have to reach for, for something like this where um, you have two options. It can be there or it can be not there. Um, so this is just a tiny example of like finding something in a hash table. Um, if I wanna look up uh, some key in a hash table, well, it might not be there or it, it might be there or it might not be there. Um, in another language that didn't have this feature, you know, you, you, you're gonna return, it's gonna return a pointer to some type and you, you, you're gonna have to remember to check that it could be null. And this is a huge source of bugs. Um, and we're really happy to have this feature in the language. Um, but the thing is, this is, this is garbagey. This is, uh, this is gonna allocate because if in the none case, well, this is, this is actually just an immediate. It's a, it's a variant without any data attached to it. But if we have um, this constructor here, this, this variant with uh, the data attached to it, that's gonna be a box value. So even if it's like some int, um, it's gonna the, the the int itself is gonna be box. We're gonna have a pointer to a struct that contains the int. Um, so we're really sad about like losing this feature of the language. Um, what can we do? Well, what you can do is you can take some value. Like if we're dealing with immediates, um, we can take some value out of the space and and just and choose that to be none. For example, we could take int min value, okay? And we'll say, if the int is, is int min value, uh, then we'll call that none. And so we're effectively like losing one value out of the, out of the universe of possible ints, but uh, we're not really sad about that. Um, int min value is kind of an arbitrary number anyway, and especially in our domain, um, the, you're not, you're not gonna see prices or quantities of in min value in the market. Um, so you could define a type like this. Um, we have this abstract type that has essentially these two functions. We can check if it's none um, and we can pull the value out of it. Um, and it's important to know like this, this function here that takes the value out of the, out of the T is really just the identity function. Like under the hood, uh, this type is really just, it's really just an int, um, but we've put a tiny abstraction over the top of it um, so that we can check if it's, if it's not. So let's have a look at the same code that we looked at before using this paradigm. Um, we're gonna look in the hash table for this key and it's gonna return this immediate option. 
and then we can say if the immediate option is none, well then we can do so, we can uh, do the do the num case. Otherwise, we can pull the value out and we can do something. Okay, it doesn't allocate. We're happy; it's much more efficient. But we've lost that type safety, that great uh, property of the type from before, which help, which makes these kinds of errors impossible. Because now I can I can call this function uncheck value to pull the value out. Um, I have to remember to call is none. So we're kind of back in the world of um, null pointer exceptions. Um, so what can we do? We, we'd really like to be able to write this and we'd like the compiler to force us to consider both cases rather than um, leaving it up to our, our diligence in remembering to check, right? Um, so we can play a little syntax trick. Um, to transform the thing we just saw into, into what we want it to look like. So what this is, is it's called PPX and it's uh, OCaml's preprocessor. Uh, so you can, we, you, can write, um, you can write your own preprocessors, pre um, which essentially, you know, before the compilation stage, um, they expand, um, this, this syntactic sugar expands to something like what we saw before. Um, and actually it's kind of neater than that. What it expands to is, um, is like an if else case where it says if false, um, if false, it'll do this thing. That is, it'll convert the thing to an, to an actual option which allocates and then it will do the match. Um, and if true, else if true, uh, it's going to do the ugly thing, right? So it's kind of neat that it expands to this thing, which gives us all the compiler guarantees that we had before in a way that the, the less efficient code is just gonna be eliminated um, by the compiler at a later stage in compilation. So we're really happy. Our code looks almost exactly the same um, and it doesn't allocate at all. It's much faster. Here's like a tiny little benchmark example. Um, you can just ignore the details of the function, but this is something that's using options. And this is something that's using immediate options. And you can see this one runs a little faster and it doesn't allocate anything. Um, this one's gonna allocate four bytes um, per run. Should I? No, I don't need to do that. Okay. Okay. Um, we're gonna look at like a bigger code example now. But I would like to pause here and ask if anyone has any questions. There is a question. All right, let's go. How does OCaml compare with Scala? Uh, I have zero experience with Scala. Do either of you have any experience with Scala? Well, I would. What I do know about Scala is that it's a JVM language, so it's basically Java with. Um, you know, more, more power uh, for functional, more support for functional programming paradigms. Um, from the very little I've looked at Scala, it looks like it has a good time system. I don't know exactly how it compares to OCaml. Um, it's gonna compile to the JVM, which is, a, which is a bit more of a complicated runtime. So the thing we love about OCaml is it compiles to, it has a very simple runtime, like Java and OCaml, both garbage collected languages. Um, the Java garbage collector is, is a bit more complicated. Java is just a, a bit heavier in general, but um, the NASDAQ itself is actually written in Java. So, um, and the Java that I imagine they use uh, in the NASDAQ is probably very similar to the kind of OCaml that we write. Like these, these languages are both high level modern languages um, with similar features. And to squeeze the most performance out of them, you need to do sort of tricks like this and understand um, how the runtime works under the hood. Um, yeah, so I don't know. That's all I can say about Scala. Um, what do you use for OCaml to work with your external allocation in C? Um, what's the library? 
there's a nice library for generating C stubs. I think there's something called C stubs. If you search OCaml C stubs, you'll find a library. Um, there's kind of a, a nice DSL for like describing interfaces to C code and actually having them auto generated. So you don't have to write the C yourself. If you have a C library, um, yeah, it's a really nice library for, for generating the stubs yourself. Um, could I repeat how an immediate option is represented? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, oh, where's the immediate option slide? So it's represented exactly like an integer. Um, it is an integer, but we're just we're just deciding like we as the programmer have made the decision that int min value is a special case. Like if you've ever programmed in C, um, you might write a function that can return uh, a valid integer, or there might be like some reserved integers. Like negative one might might represent a certain error, or negative two might represent a different error. Um, it's kind of like that. We're just taking one number. Uh, in this case, we take like the least obtrusive number, which would be like the one at the far end of the spectrum. And we're just going to say that's none. If any of our functions return that, it's none. Um, but we're using like the OCaml type system to, to wrap it up and package it in a type. We're not changing the representation at all, but we're, we're just, we're wrapping it up in, in an interface that says you can check if it's none and you can get the value. And if you want to operate on it, you kind of, you need to pull it out of the box. But that doesn't change the representation at all. It's literally just an in um, with, with one special value reserved. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. All right, we're gonna look at some actual code now. Okay. So I covered a lot of stuff, but remember back to the message packaging, uh, message processing system, okay? Um, let's imagine we wanna do this in the simplest way. So we're receiving like a stream of data um, in some binary format um, from an exchange. And we, we might just go ahead and define some types. Um, the types of these are not super important. It, this is just imagine this is an arbitrary message uh, from an exchange. It might have an exchange ID, um, a sequence number, a symbol, and, and a list of book entries where each book entry has a size surprise, um, a side, whatever, right? Just imagine this is the format we're getting from the exchange. Um, so we could, when, as we're receiving the, the stream of data, we could go ahead and pause the, pause the bytes out of the out of the stream and allocate um, this record um, and build these objects, just native OCaml objects and operate on them. That's all nice, simple. That's what you would do um, if performance weren't super, super critical. Um, but this is gonna allocate a lot. Like imagine we're getting millions of messages um, around, around the close. Um, we're constantly allocating, the garbage collector's going crazy. Um, we can't really do that. Um, so what do we do? Well, the most efficient thing to do is to read in these bytes from, from the network into an array, right? You, you allocate a buffer, um, some pre-allocated buffer at the start of your program to hold the incoming data. So that the data comes in, we read it into this array. And then what we want to do is we just want to you know, seek to a certain position. I know uh, the, the exchange ID is here. These four bytes of the exchange ID, let me just read that, put it into a register, do something with it. Let me have a look at this secnum at some other position. We just wanna, we wanna read in the bytes and we just wanna kind of poke at it and get the bits out of it we want without, without allocating these records. So what might that look like? Um, there's a lot of code here you don't need to understand really any of it, we're gonna scroll down. Um, here's some functions for like pulling out, um, pulling out the information. So here's a function that takes um, a buffer. This is gonna be an array of bytes. It's a, it's a mutable block 
where we can read the data into. And we've just read in a message. And so we can pull out the exchange ID by going to position five um, and you know reading those 64 bits there. Um, and, and that's gonna be our exchange ID. Now, like I said, this is like the most efficient thing you could do, but this code is horrible. I wouldn't wanna write this code. I wouldn't wanna read this code. I wouldn't wanna maintain this code. Uh, nobody wants to write code like this, right? Um, these numbers, it's just in, in, incredibly brittle. Going in there and changing something, a complete nightmare, right? Um, so what we can do is we can have a program write this code for us. Um, so we've got, um, we call this library protogen. Um, and this is essentially a library where you can specify the layout of a message. So you can say, you can say exactly where the fields are um, and what, what types they are, how many, how many bytes they take and so on and um, have it compile to OCaml. So that code we just looked at above was output by this program here. So this is the code that we read, this is the code that we write, and this is the code that we maintain. Just this definition of, of what the message is and how, how we expect the messages to be formatted. Um, and this is just much more convenient than writing that low level stuff. And it gives us a nice interface. So like those functions that we were looking at before, um, it, gives us, it gives us these nice functions for reading, reading these values out. So let's have a look. Let's compare the two, like compare the simple thing that you would write um, your first time if you weren't, if you weren't really caring um, versus the one that uses the protogen library. Um, so uh, let's have a look at this function, calculate size. It's gonna take some input buffer because whenever we're reading something from the network, it's, it's gotta go somewhere. We're gonna read some bytes into some array ready to be parsed. Um, and we're gonna do some stuff. So like um, there might be many messages in the buffer. And as we iterate through the message, we're going to parse out the next message. So we're gonna take that block of bytes. We're gonna allocate some type and then we're going to iterate over the book entries and add up the sizes or something like that. It's not really important what we're doing. Um, if we look down at the efficient version, this is the one that doesn't allocate anything. The one that just reaches in there and pokes, pokes our buffer. Um, you can see it's not like much worse. <laughs> um, we're going to call this function of iobuff exception. So we're passing in buffer and we're getting back a message. Now this looks a lot like what we did here, but we're not allocating anything. All this function does is takes, takes the array. It's essentially, it's taking a pointer to the array and it's, it's doing a tiny bit of validation. So it's gonna look at like the first byte and see, is this the right message I expected? And if it is, it, it just returns, it, it's just the identity function. It's gonna return the same value except now our message is of type book update. So it's just like, uh, it's just like the immediate in from before. Um, we're just wrapping it up in a little abstraction. So we haven't allocated anything. Uh, we've got our message and now we can pull all these fields out and do the same adding up like we did before. Um, we have to use a for loop instead of a list map because we don't have a list. We don't want to allocate a list. Uh, we just have a sequence of things that we can look at in the, in the, in the buffer. And here's just a benchmark to compare the two. Um, the first one runs in about five microseconds. And the second one runs in 700 nanoseconds. And here tells you how much the things allocate. So this one's allocating quite a lot. And this one's not allocating at all. Um, so if you think back to the beginning of the talk, we were talking about how fast we need to be about 750 nanoseconds. It looks like we've we've achieved our goal. Um, and yeah, we made it about eight times faster. Um, you might say like, it was a lot of work to make it 
uh, a lot faster. You had to write this library, this DSL and all that stuff. But the analysis we did at the beginning like shows us that we just can't afford um, to be any slower than this. Um, and we did it all in OCaml um, while preserving uh, all of the nice high level programming features that we like without really getting our hands dirty with um, with writing those um, those unsafe memory accesses and so on. Um, I'll take a moment to wait for any questions about this code before I move on. Okay. If uh, any questions come in, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to, to answer them. Um, oh, there's a question. Is this still zero alloc if exception throws an exception? Uh, probably not. So like I said, um, we really care about the hot path, right? We, we care about like the normal flow of, of code during normal operation. If there's an exception, if there's some kind of error case, and like we something's gone wrong we we generally don't care about allocating in that case um so usually error handling code allocates freely um because you know they're errors we we don't expect them to happen if we did expect them to happen then then yeah we we try not to raise an exception um so we crash it um well, like this is not real code. It's a toy, kind of a toy example. Um, yeah, you can see I'm just calling this function that can raise an exception without like without a try and catch clause or something. But in real production code, we would um, make sure to handle it. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, oh, I had another slide in here. Let's have a look at these cards. Um, so that was sort of the main part of the talk about uh, allocations and um, avoiding allocations, but let's quickly talk about what else can slow you down. Um, function calls can slow you down. Um, well, you might think function, function calls are pretty simple, right? It's just sort of a jump statement, but um, you know, there's some overhead and like, you might have to kick some stuff out of registers, put them on the stack. Um, you might get instruction cache misses. You may have too many function arguments. They don't all fit in registers. They need to spill over onto the stack. Um, there's all these things. But really, these aren't things we think about a lot um, because um, systems systems are usually pretty good. Like like uh, branch prediction is really good these days. These aren't things we really need to think about. But in OCaml, um, functions can often be closures. So like a function definition, if it has some data outside of it um, that it uses, well, it's not really like a it's not really a function. It's a closure, right? It's got some data attached to it. Um, so you need to allocate for that. Um, that's what we want to avoid. And um, the more functions you have, um, the fewer compiler optimizations you can have in general. So this, this is sort of specific to OCaml. The OCaml compiler is not the smartest compiler in the world. Um, and often it struggles to make optimizations across function boundaries. Like the scope of a function is sort of the limits of its optimizations um, in a lot of cases. Um, so what can you do about that? Well, the main technique is inlining. And um, this is not something that we do by hand, really. But this is something that our um, tools and compilers team thinks a lot about. So 
let's just look at an example of inlining. So here's, here's a little function G. Um, it takes a single argument flag. And here we call it with true. And here we call it with false. Um, this arg here is the argument to f. So it's outside the function. It's using this variable outside the function. So this function is actually a closure. Um, so that would allocate. Um, but if we inline the function, which is basically just taking the body of the function and replacing, replacing every call to the function with the body of the function, um, it's not quite that simple, but that's essentially what we're doing. Uh, we get something like this, and you can see like, now there's some obvious optimizations for the compiler to do next. Like if true, well, this if else statement is just always true, we can replace it with this single um, expression here and same down here. Um, so this is something that the compiler does. Like I said, something that our uh, tools and compilers team thinks a lot about, um, about when to inline, because if you just inlined everything all the time, uh, your program would actually be a lot slower than if you didn't inline at all. Uh, it's not, um, there's no free lunch here. Like um, the more you inline, the more repeated code you have, the bigger your uh, program is and the less cache efficient uh, your program's gonna be. Um, so yeah, that's, some, that's something that our uh, tools and compilers team thinks a lot about. Um, so you've optimized your code and um, the compiler optimizes it really well. Um, you put it into production. Is it actually fast? Well, it might not be. Um, there's some more things you can think about. We're not going to go into any of this, but um, they're fun to think about. Um, like in the example we looked at, we have a program that basically just reads from a network, does a little bit of stuff, writes out the packets. Um, you might find that a program like this spends most of its time sort of in the network stack, like reading, um, reading bytes from the network card. And it's sort of um, spending most of its time calling the operating system. Um, so there's certain things you can do to like get around that. Um, there's this interesting concept called the cold hardware tax, which is where sometimes when you write a program, if the program is like not very busy, it's doing uh, only a little bit of stuff, um, it can be quite slow. But then when, when it gets very busy and it's doing a lot of work, it actually gets faster at doing that stuff. Um, the throughput increases. Um, and that's what we call the cold hardware tax. Um, and it's just sort of a matter of the OS like um, switching, switching processes and that sort of thing. So that's, that's something you can think about. Um, there's lots of other things you can, you can tweak in your deployment. So one of the takeaways here, um, you should always understand your requirements. Um, like I said at the beginning, most software, we, we, we write at Jane Street and most software in the world doesn't need to be written like this and probably shouldn't be written like this. Um, when you need to write performance code, you should really understand like how exactly, how fast do we need to be? How fast is fast enough? And um, it really pays to know your language in depth, to understand the tools you have um, in, in some depth so that you can use them effectively. And um, if you're careful, and if you use some of the techniques we showed you, you can, you can achieve really high performance um, while being safe and using a, using a standard language and, and doing high level programming like we all like to do and write the kind of code that we like to maintain and read. Um, so that's, that's the talk, that's all I had today. Can I explain the OS stack bypasses again? Okay, I, I can talk a little bit about OS stack bypasses. Um, I'm definitely not an expert in this area, but um, you can sort of, you can use accelerated device drivers and libraries that give you kind of lower level access to your network card, for example. If you're trying to read and write bytes um, from the network as fast as possible, um, using the standard like operating system 
uh, system calls, um, maybe maybe too slow. So you might want to bypass that whole thing and get more direct access to the card. And because the operating system in general exists to protect um, different processes from each other, um, but if you control your deployment environment and your you have a dedicated machine for this uh, for this application, uh, you can do this sort of thing and like you can sort of work at a lower level um, to read bytes like directly from a card or, or something like that. Um, you can also do like operating system tweaks like um, pinning a certain process to a certain core so that it never gets swapped out by the, the system scheduler and that sort of thing. Um, are there risks of memory leaks in OCaml? from closure allocations. Um, I mean, yeah, there's not, there's, um, I can't think of like a concrete example to give you like a concise answer, but you could certainly leak memory if you weren't careful about um, having these kind of, creating these references to things you didn't think were, were referenced. But um, I think it's just, it's similar to any, garbage collected language. Uh, it's generally pretty memory safe. Um, what kind of hardware would be needed to run in production? Um, we run most of our stuff on pretty standard hardware. Um, we buy like fancy network cards uh, in particular, but our server boxes are like Dell machines. Um, you know, we buy the best ones, but they're nothing, uh, they're nothing crazy. Um, is memory nearly, uh, sorry, did Javesh have a question before this? Right. Is memory nearly as important a concern as speed for your work? Uh, definitely not. So I think the question says like, are we as constrained for memory generally as we are for CPU? And I think uh, there's sort of two sides to that question. Um, are we like constrained in, in terms of how much memory we have and how much we can allocate? No, not at all. Like memory is very cheap, um, but CPUs are so fast these days that like the slowest part of your program is often reading from memory. So the more cache inefficient your program is, and the more it's like reading out to main memory, um, that's like, that's where most of your performance is gonna go um, a lot of the time in most applications. Um, so yeah, I'd say like almost, almost all applications are, are memory bound in terms, of, um, in terms of their performance in a big way. Uh, what kind of hardware is used by companies like JStreet? Yeah, I think I covered that. Um, okay. We've still got a few minutes if anyone has any more questions. I hope I answered all the questions so far. Do I wanna finish my slides? Oh yeah. All right, guys, uh, we're hiring. Um, <laughs> it, we, we, we hire interns from all over the place, lots of cool places. Um, we're hiring here, particularly in Hong Kong and uh, in our other offices in London and uh, New York as well. Will multi-core or can will necessarily help here? Um, so for this, particular application, like I said, we weren't really gonna talk about parallelization. You can probably think of a way you, you might be able to parallelize this, um, but often with this sort of market data processing, it's just a fact that the, the exchange is gonna deliver you like this fire hose of everything and you don't really have any choice but to process it all. Um, obviously once once the data is like inside our systems and you know we're distributing it to the clients within the firm, um, those 
downstream clients will only get the data that they care about. Uh, and we kind of fan out there. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, you, you, you often have to have a system that can process it all. Um, although you may have like one system per exchange, for example, um, to, to parallelize that. But it's not always, uh, not always possible. What kind of skills are required of a software developer in Jane Street? Um, well, we have a lot of teams within Jane Street. So not every software developer does the same things. Um, but I'd say in general, what we're looking for are generalist programmers who sort of know, uh, who know their tools well, understand how a machine works. Like, if you know a little bit about, um, if you know a little bit about systems and like, um, the slower level stuff we're talking about, caches and memory and just a little bit, um, and your algorithms and data structures, and uh, hopefully you're excited about functional programming. But it's not a requirement to know OCaml, for sure. Thank you, Malcolm, for a very insightful talk. So um, after today's Friday Hacks, we hope that you have gained a better perspective of Bayesian networks and old camera. And before you leave, I would like to, uh, I would like all of you, in, if possible, to fill in the feedback form regarding today's Friday hacks. So um, I'll be sharing my screen later. So we really appreciate if all of you, the audience, could give us a feed, in, insightful feedback about today's session. And thank you, Malcolm, once again. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you, everyone. Hmm? Oh, yeah. uh, is it okay if I share screen now? Bye. Thank you. Sorry, give me a few minutes while I set up. So if you haven't joined the NEF Hackers channel, please join via this QR code and also please fill in the feedback form. Thank you. The session is officially over. You guys can leave once you have um, scanned.